Good evening. I'm Vic Townsend, I'm Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences of the College of New Rochelle, and it's really my privilege to welcome you this evening to this event panel discussion, The Mind in the Age of Environmental Destruction. I'm going to leave the introductions of our panel to our, our moderator, Dan Smith, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, but I do want to welcome all of our distinguished panelists here this evening. It's good to have you with us. I also want to invite each of you to remain after the panel is done for a reception which we'll be having in the lounge just around the corner. As we sit here during Earth Week on the eve of Earth Day, I realize that sometimes we take the gifts that we're given for granted. And among those gifts are our environment and our health, physical and emotional. Tonight's panel is going to consider how changes in that gift we're given of the environment may affect our health in particular and our our emotional health in particular. I want you to know that this entire evening is possible, has been made possible by gifts, two gifts that were given to the college. First of those gifts came from a recent alumna, Jennifer Smith, graduated a few years ago in the English department, and she generously gave a donation to the English department uh, to be used at the English department's discretion. Conferring with Nick Smart, who's chair of the English department with us this evening, we decided that we would use these funds for this purpose. Jennifer can't be with us this evening, but we do acknowledge her and thank her for her generosity. The second gift came from another alumna a few years earlier, Lillian Carney and her family, who generously funded the establishment of an endowed chair in English in the memory of one of Lillian's classmates, Mary Ellen Donnelly. The chair is the Mary Ellen Donnelly Critchlow Chair in English. The first holder of that position at the College of New Rochelle is our moderator, Dan Smith. And I have to say that his presence and his assembling of this panel is yet another gift to the college. Now, Dan told me to be brief about his introduction, but I do have to say a few things. Dan is a Brooklyn-based author, journalist, and editor. His first book, Muses, Mad Men, and Prophets, Hearing Voices in the Borders of Sanity, was published by Penguin in 2007. That same year, he served as associate editor of the American Idea, the best of the Atlantic Monthly, 150 years of writers who shaped our history. He's a former staff writer at the Atlantic, and he's contributed essays and articles to numerous publications, including the New York Times Magazine, where he published an article this past January entitled, Is There an Ecological Unconscious? He's written extensively about mental health and psychology, among other topics, and is currently working on a memoir about anxiety. It's my pleasure to introduce Dan to begin the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Thompson, for the introduction, especially a bit about the anxiety. Uh, I invite you all to perspire. I will be. Um, uh, a number of people at the College of New Rochelle have been very helpful in planning this panel. Uh, including Dr. Nick Smart of the English Department, Dr. Amy Bass of the History Department, Dr. Faith Kossel Hughes of the Environmental Studies Program, and Catherine DeLazaro of the Center for Academic Excellence. But it's safe to say that the event wouldn't have gotten off the ground at all were it not for the administrative uh, energies of Dean Thompson. So thanks again. Uh, a hearty thank you also to the College of Arts and Sciences for sponsoring this discussion, to everybody in attendance for coming out, and of course to our distinguished panel for participating. Uh, before I give some background about the topic of our conversation, I'd like to go ahead and, and uh, finally introduce our panelists. Uh, it's a fairly diverse group, and this is uh, by design. Environmental problems in general, and in particular how we process, relate, and respond psychologically to environmental problems, are subjects of universal importance. Uh, so it seemed wise when considering whom to invite, not to restrict the event to a single discipline, but to turn to people uh, whom I knew grappled in their personal as well as in their professional lives with the topic at hand. The subject is inherently ecological as the mind in the age of environmental destruction seemed wise to be interdisciplinary. Uh, the result is a panel of four individuals who, despite many similarities between them, are engaged in very different work. So uh, to introduce, uh, introduce our panelists from uh, the far end to the nearest, Chad Harback, uh, is the executive editor of N Plus One Magazine, a New York-based journal of politics, literature, and culture that in a very short period of time, about six years to be exact, has had an extraordinary impact on the world of literature and ideas, 
ushering many exciting new writers into print, and boldly interrogating the presumptions of many established, uh, some would say too established, writers. The magazine has garnered exuberant praise from the likes of the novelist Jan Jonathan Franzen, the journalist Malcolm Gladwell, the New York Times critic A.O. Scott, who called N plus one, quote, a generational struggle against laziness and cynicism. <laughs> one of N plus one's own editors has referred to the magazine a little less reverently as, quote, like partisan review, except not dead. <laughs> Um, that it is still not dead, despite being a small circulation leftist print journal in the heyday of Twitter, is due not least of all, I believe, to Chad's impassioned but carefully re reasoned essays on ecological themes. Over the course of several years and several issues, Chad has written about uh, global climate change, <coughs> politics of environmentalism, and so-called post-catastrophe novels, such as Cormac McCarthy's The Road, to name just some of his subjects. During this time, he has also completed and sold the first novel, tentatively titled The Art of Feeling, which will be published by Little Brown in, I think, two, uh, 2011, correct? Uh, the subject of that novel is a baseball team at a small Midwestern college, but uh, when I spoke to Chad on the phone the other day, he assured me that there's going to be some global warming in there as well. <laughs> uh, Katie Halton is an award-winning visual artist, now based in Manhattan, who was born in Dublin and raised in rural Ireland. She studied fine art and history at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin and at the, I'm sure I'm going to mangle this German, uh, the Hochschule der Kunst in Berlin. Was that, was that all right? All right, I guess she doesn't know. <laughs> Since graduating, uh, Katie has established herself also in a very short period of time as one of the world's leading artists to explore the relationship between humans and the natural environment, which is often done with the intention of encouraging viewers to attend more intensely to their landscape. In 2003, when she was just 28 years old, Katie represented Ireland at the 50th Venice Biennale. Her project there included uh, documenting weeds that were growing around the city, uh, an activity she has engaged in uh, in even more depth in cities around the world, digging up and replanting weeds, documenting them, drawing her, uh, them. Uh, and this has earned her the not always pleasant title, the Weed Lady. Uh, Katie came to the United States in a Fulbright scholarship in 2004, and in 2007, she had her first solo American museum show at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, for which she constructed a massive tree uh, to fill the whole gallery from roots to branches, uh, all out of recycled material. Last year, at the invitation of the City of New York and the Bronx Museum of the Arts, Katie created the Tree Museum, a monumental public artwork celebrating the centennial of the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. For that project, Katie assigned an individual phone number to 100 trees along a four and a half mile stretch of that historic roadway and invited museum goers, because there's no really word, other word for it, to call from their cell phones and listen to figures as diverse as DJ Jazzy J, legendary Bronx DJ, and the architect Daniel Liebeskind, uh, offer personalized reflections on the borough and its landscape and their lives. About Katie's work, the magazine Art Forum has written the following, in a society that increasingly excludes nature from everyday life, how can today's art engage with the natural landscape? Katie Holton is looking for an answer to that question. Uh, and I should add as a side note that tomorrow afternoon, uh, which is the 40th anniversary of Earth Day, Katie's going to be participating in another panel discussion at the CUNY Graduate Center on Fifth Avenue. Uh, that panel discussion is titled Illuminating the Science, Art and Climate Change. So uh, if you're interested in that, please talk to Katie afterwards, because it should be a really great event. Uh, speaking of CUNY, our next panelist, Susan Apatow, is a professor at that university. She teaches in the Sociology Department at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice and the PhD program in social personality psychology and the doctoral program in criminal justice at the Graduate Center. Before coming to New York, Susan was based at the University of Massachusetts in Boston, where she taught dispute resolution, a phrase that offers a clue as to the focus of her work. In her own words, her research concerns the psychology excuse me, of conflict and injustice, particularly the processes that lead to what's called moral exclusion, in which people come to see others as outside their scope of justice, and therefore eligible targets of violence and harm, and those which lead to moral inclusion, in which rights and resources are extended. Susan has studied the psychology of justice as it relates to achievement among public high school students, post-9-11 recovery of New York, and hate crimes, to name just a few of her subjects. Um, but the bedrock of her work has been her extensive studies, over the course of about 20 years now, into the psychology of environmental conflict and decline. Uh, which is conducted in order to better understand what leads people to either include or exclude the natural world from their moral vision. This aspect of her work resulted in 2003 in the book Identity in the Natural Environment, the, Psychologies, the Psychological Significance of Nature, which she uh, edited with the psychologist Susan Clayton, 
and which one reader stated uh, tackled subjects, quote, of the utmost importance for our, importance for our future well-being, even our survival as a species. And last but not least, on the end, Robert Sullivan is a prolific journalist, for me, also a freelance journalist, a uh, depressingly prolific freelance journalist, <laughs> and the author of six distinguished books of nonfiction, the first of which, 1998's The Meadowlands, set the tone for much of the work that was to come, at least uh, in this reader's eyes. The Meadowlands is an idios idiosyncratic, deeply reported, often extremely funny travelogue that explores the history, culture, and flora of those infamous New Jersey swamplands where Jimmy Hoffa may or may not be buried. It is also, uh, in its way, deadly serious. Reviewing the Meadowlands in the New York Times, the poet Robert Pinsky wrote, by looking ob observantly, without trite moralizing, at the natural world as well as at the disposable world we build, this book suggests a challenging new model for how we ought to pay attention. And indeed, Robert has set some strange precedents for paying attention. Uh, several years ago, he spent a whole year observing a colony of rats in an alley not far from Wall Street. Um, no jokes, please, about Rats in Wall Street. Um, this is for his 2004 book titled Rats, which went on to become a bestseller, which led one reviewer to dub Robert an urban Thoreau, which I know he has taken some exception to. Uh, but nevertheless, I think somewhat answering this call, perhaps, his latest book, which I commend to everyone, uh, is titled The Thoreau You Don't Know, What the Prophet of Environmentalism Really Meant. Uh, Robert has been the recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowship, and he is currently writing a book on the American Revolution with an emphasis on the relationship between geography and history. So, a few words, uh, hopefully briefly, about our topic here. This panel has its origins in a trip I took in the summer of 2009 uh, to a region of eastern Australia known as the Upper Hunter Valley. Um, the Upper Hunter, which is in the southeastern part of the country, has always been an extremely pastoral part, very pastoral part of Australia. For generations, people called it the Tuscany of the South. Um, it was, and to some extent still is, filled with these beautiful rolling alfalfa fields, giant dairy farms, uh, but privately owned dairy farms, and, and quaint English-style villages. Uh, but it has the misfortune of uh, happening to sit on top of a massive reservoir, reservoir of black coal, uh, which Australia happens to be very much in the business of extracting and exporting. People have known for more than 100 years that there was coal beneath the Upper Hunter, but they didn't start removing it seriously about, until about two decades ago. And in the last 10 years, they've been removing it at uh, alarming rates. The way they, uh, by they I mean the energy companies, remove the coal is through what Australians call open pit mining, which basically means that they set off tremendous bundles of chemical explosives and blast away all the sediment and the rock and so on. Um, they set these blasts off constantly, uh, almost every day, in fact. And what it does is it sends these massive plumes of dirt, dust, uh, and so on over the hills where they settle on everything, on people's houses, uh, on uh, people's um, crops, uh, on the hides of livestock, and, of course, into the water. Uh, then the companies take all the debris and they form it into giant mounds, artificial hills, uh, which they then spread seed on and which seeds don't uh, tend to sort of grow into brush that doesn't last very long. So the hills denude, and what you're left with um, is, so you're left with, in the end, is first explosions, uh, second, polluted waterways, and third, a radically altered landscape. Um, the reason I went to Australia wasn't just to see this landscape for myself, but to talk to a philosopher and environmental activist I had spoken to on the phone named Glenn Albrecht. Uh, Glenn Albrecht doesn't live too far from the Upper Hunter Valley. He lives in a town called Newcastle, which is where they ship the coal. It's one of the largest exporting port, uh, coal exporting ports in the world. Um, I want to talk to Albrecht because when the residents of the Upper Hunter began trying to organize to fight the mines, they called on him for advice. And when he went to speak to them, he noticed that they were suffering what seemed like a whole slew of psychological complaints. Anxiety, depression, despair, insomnia, restlessness, anger. Um, and Albrecht's inclination uh, at first, and what he studied with his colleagues later on, was to see these complaints in environmental terms, in ecological terms. Um, many years ago, nostalgia, uh, basically homesickness, the experience of homesickness, was considered officially a psychiatric complaint. Um, soldiers in the US Army would go off to war, and uh, before they even had to step into battle, 
they would have this experience of sadness and nervous disorientation uh, that would lead them to become paralyzed. Um, and often they would be sent home. It's very similar uh, in, in uh, cross-disciplinary studies to what Native Americans and other indigenous peoples have experienced when they're forced off their land. Uh, one philosopher has called this place pathology. Uh, being forced to leave home results in a kind, a kind of mental illness, if we want to think of it that way. Albrecht's idea, uh, which I say, as I say, he went on to study uh, and report on scientific journals with a number of colleagues from his university, was that the residents of the Upper Hunter were also suffering for a, from a kind of place pathology, uh, except that there was one catch. They'd never left home. Uh, what was happening, in his mind, was that the valley was changing around them. And so they were experiencing the same sense of nostalgia as if you'd left. Uh, Albrecht coined a word for this condition. He called it solastalgia, uh, which combines the meaning from solace and soul with the root word allergia, or pain. And he has argued further that solastalgia is not limited to people living near coal quarries or Superfund sites or oil spills or power plants, but that it is in our day and age a kind of universal condition felt by everyone to some degree. It has to be, he thinks, because the landscape around us is changing radically. The urbanization, air pollution, or industrial runoff, the mass extinction of species, and of course, global warming. And uh, to me, this was a very provocative idea. Uh, not just because it pathologizes uh, what most of us would think of as a common sense observation. If the coal miners moved next door to any of us, we'd probably be pretty, be pretty bummed out as well. Uh, but because it drew attention to an aspect of environmental destruction that, to my mind, wasn't often talked about and that is extremely hard and maybe impossible to measure. Uh, this aspect is, I mean, the relationship between the state of the natural world um, and the state of our minds. Or to put this idea more broadly, the connection between the planet and our interior lives. Uh, the idea of solastalgia transmitted to me in a very modern way what was and what is a very ancient idea that there is no stark dividing line between us and nature. So that if nature is assaulted, we are too. And not just in the obvious ways, but deep down in our consciousness and perhaps even in our unconscious. Um, I, I'm not going to say much more. There's a, a field of psychology, a subfield that uh, in fact takes this as our premise, that there is an inherent um, and inherited connection between the mind and nature that environmental degradation can only affect. Uh, it is an old idea. It's a very difficult idea, as I say, to measure. But I just want to take this idea of solastalgia as a starting off point uh, to talk about the idea of the connection between mental health and environmental health, and beyond that, uh, the connection between nature and the psyche. Uh, what we're going to do, the format of the discussion is going to be uh, pretty simple. I'm going to ask everybody in turn this question just to get the ball rolling. Uh, then we will uh, ask more questions. I'll ask more questions, and hopefully the discussion will uh, start between the panelists. And then I'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, Katie, I, I, I'd like to start with Katie because um, when we talked on the phone about the panel, you uh, you mentioned, and I know you mentioned this in your work a lot, the how much it's mean to you to grow up in a rural environment and then move after lots of uh, sort of rootless wandering, uh, doing your work wherever you happen to be, to New York and into Manhattan, which um, I think, as I might have mentioned to you, uh, I remember a quote, I think, from the novelist Martin Amos who said that, uh, um, Manhattan is the most violence that's ever been done to a single patch of land in the history of mankind. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to, on a personal level, how the shift in setting from rural to urban has affected you psychologically and emotionally, and, and how it's affected your work, which deals with these issues. Um, I, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, so first of all, before I answer the question, I just want to say thanks um, to Dan for inviting me here and being part of this panel. It's really exciting for me because I don't th I'm very used to speaking on panels with other visual artists. Um, we're kind of in our bubble and talk about the same things to the same people over and over. So this is really nice to kind of move beyond the art world. Um, and I'm also not going to be showing images, which is another unusual thing. So um, I think this is the first time I've ever done that, spoken without showing images. So I feel a little bit naked. <laughs> um, and I handed out some of these to everybody um, 
just so that you I kind of cheated, I guess, because Dan told me I could, wouldn't be able to show images, so this is a way of cheating, so you can see some pictures. Um, so, yeah, so it's lovely to be here, and um, it's, like, your introduction, I think you kind of covered, you touched on all of the, the base points, I think, um, so I might be repeating some of that. But I did grow up in rural Ireland, but I don't know if that's exactly the image that everybody would have in their head when they think of rural Ireland. Um, so I, I didn't grow up in Donegal or Galway or Cork or those, you know, the areas that are just green with little stone walls. I was in the middle, a place called Longford, right in the middle of Ireland where it's very boggy. And uh, so I guess it was just like in this normal place, but it was the countryside. And my mum, is a gardener, she's a person, like even though she grew up in the city too, so um, I guess I am a, I am the result of my mum and my dad, okay? <laughs> um, and th that's the bottom line. My mum was a gardener, my dad was an accountant, so I kind of, my way of looking at the world is like a combination of those two outlooks, I guess. It took me years to realise it in a formal way, I just always took it for granted that this is who I am and this is the way I look at things. I've always tried to figure out how the world is connected, how it works. So when I was little, I was always outside. Um, I'm the eldest of four kids, so I was always, um, I had years where it was just me running around on my own in the fields with the cows and climbing trees. Um, so my way of looking at things is very, um, that, that, that's my reality, I guess, comes from those years, the first 10 years of my life where I was just outside, everything was green, things grew, I knew where the milk came from, we knew where the meat came from, we knew where um, the tomatoes and the mushrooms and everything came from because we went and we got it from the person who was growing it or producing it. Um, and then uh, I moved to, well I ended up in Manhattan, but we kind of, it was like a stage in between where I was traveling a lot. Um, and I think it was I've been in Manhattan about three years and I started, you see, because I don't have images now, I don't, it's hard to talk about what I did in between, like you mentioned working with weeds. Um, I would basically go for walks because I'm, I'm always outside, um, that's how I kind of connect with the place, I, I wander around. And because um, most of the time it's just wandering, there usually isn't really a destination. And um, I started transplanting weeds and sometimes I would bring them inside a gallery space or um, just transplant them to other parts of the city or take them inside and do my own little pseudo experiments. Um, and then, uh, that, so that's when I started working with the living world because I knew that this is exactly what, you know, I'm interested in what's out there and how I relate to, to place, whether that be the countryside or in the town or the city because I studied in Dublin um, as well as Berlin and Paris. Um, I didn't study in Paris. Um, so now I've kind of gone off on a tangent. But the, uh, the, before, you know, when you invited me to be on the panel, I kind of dismissed it at first and said, oh yeah, well, I grew up in the countryside and then I came to the city. Um, but I, I started to realize, well, I'm not the only one who grew up in the countryside. Like the rest of my family grew up in the same place I did, but they don't necessarily have the same relationship that I do. So it, it was something that, it's something that's kind of been said and maybe dismissed and it's an easy way to talk over these issues. Like, oh, Katie makes this work because she came, she came from this place. Um, and it's without even questioning it. And then when I started to think about it myself, I was like, well, wait a minute, what about my, my sister and my two brothers and even my mum? Why aren't they relating to the natural world in this way too? So I think there's something just about who I am, maybe. And I, cause I'm not a, I don't deal with psychology. I've never really gone to that. Road, so this, that isn't my area at all, but that, that's just one thing that I started thinking about when you invited me to be on this panel, but I hadn't really thought about that before. Um, and so the work that I started making when I found myself in New York, I, I kind of threw myself um, into the city. I wanted to spend at least a year uh, in Manhattan because it was so different to where I'd been before um, and for that period of time. So I'd been traveling a lot, usually I'd spend like two weeks max or like four weeks max in the city, um, and then just move around. So after a couple of months in Manhattan, I started to really feel this, uh, that, like there was something wrong with me, I was really <coughs> green. green. Um, and it's hard to describe, but it was just like this um, uh, gap, I guess it's a few, a few 
go away from wherever you love, you, you have this um, this feeling too. So, uh, you know, I try to go to the parks or whatever, um, but it doesn't really do it. <laughs> uh, so then I started making this series of drawings, and if, if you have this, you can see um, inside there's a reproduction of one of the drawings. It's just a very simple black and white um, pen on paper. Yes, why I'm cheating. <laughs> um, so there's a whole series of drawings that I started doing, and I had, I've made lots of, like my work is drawing based, that's how I kind of try and figure things out. Um, but I had never really work, it's so minimal, and it's really reduced um, and clean. And this all came out of the, the walks that I was doing in the city, I realized what street trees, these are the most immediate ways that people in the city have to connect with the natural nature. And that this, and I have to say, the reason I really wanted to be in New York was a Fulbright scholarship, I kind of, had set my own little independent research agenda and it was to investigate, okay, my, who I am, I'm interested in nature, the environment, what is nature, what is environment, and I really wanted to push what it was I was dealing with in my own work and um, that was the kind of the, the goal, I guess, at the outset. Um, and so this work, the tree drawings, that was the beginning of it, and like the, the, then I made this large sculpture, um, that Dan mentioned out of recycled material. Um, and then that led to the Tree Museum, like almost four years, five years later, um, after being in New York. So I, I probably have battled on a bit too long. No, uh, you, you mentioned, though, something that, I, that touched upon uh, Susan's work, and that actually leads very well into... Well, I should mention, um, when I... I'd been here a month or two, I can't remember, and I went up to MIT to visit Media Lab, and I ended up in the MIT bookstore, and I found a book. <laughs> and I was so excited, and so I, you know, I have it with all its, the post-its and the little notes. Um, and that was, it feels like a hundred years ago, but it was only like five and a half years ago, five years ago. And so that was one of, so that was the beginning of me arriving in Manhattan, trying to figure out place, identity, then I found this book, it was covering all of these issues and it's the section of the trees and so when I went back to the tree museum like all of this was very um, it's exactly dull connected. So you do think about the psychology of it then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah but not in a I guess I'm more vague because artists are allowed to be vague um, I don't have to be uh, specific and say well this is the way I did the experiment and these were the you know what is it when you have the the test group and then control. the control, the control group. Right. Yeah, I don't have to do any of that. Um, I'm free, and that's the wonderful thing about being an artist, you can basically do whatever you want. And that's why I was able to do something like the Free Museum, because right. it fell into the cracks. I was able to do things that the Parks Department really, really wanted to do. They were one of the commissioners of the project, and they were like, yeah, we, we love this, this is something that we'd love to be able to do in the city, but they're not allowed to do it for various reasons. The DOT, the Department of Transportation, same thing. They can't do it either. The, all of these official organizations and institutions just are kind of stuck and they have restrictions and because I'm an artist I can kind of get away with it. It's still difficult, there's still lots of paperwork, but you're able to do things that maybe other people can't do. Well, uh, uh, passing the baton to the scientist who, who can't uh, do whatever she should like at any time, uh, but one thing that you had mentioned, you know, is the question of why is it that it's not? It can't be simply a matter of background. This this sense of, on the one hand, connection with the natural world, and on the other hand, um, fear about what's happening to the natural world, because you have relatives who have the same background and didn't uh, and don't have the same same feelings, and who haven't made the natural environment such an important part of their lives and of their work. Um, and Susan's. Uh, Work often focuses on this idea of the scope of the scope of justice. Um, what is it that we bring into our, our sort of moral purview? Uh, and so, one of the questions I wanted to ask I had to do exactly uh, with that, which is: um, Is there a connection between someone's proximity to the natural environment, um, immerse uh, you know how how deeply immersed they are in the natural environment? Um, and the likelihood that they're actually going to include that environment in the scope of their scope of justice. So that's my introductory question to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
want to start by thanking thanking you for for creating this evening, the space we're all in together, and it's wonderful also to be on the campus. It's a beautiful campus. This is an amazing room. It's partly a panopticon, where <laughs> but it's also partly intimate. And so I hope that I look forward to you being part of the discussion. Thank you all for coming. Um, so the scope of justice. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the question, I guess, as a, as a, so as a psychologist, I do feel boundless. And, say that that's maybe the, the luxury of being in it for some time and not needing to be constantly reviewed by my peers. So I can do what I'd like. Um, and there is a sense of almost um, artistic abandonment in, in, in any field, I think. And, and I, I hope I embody the spirit you described. This is what you said was very beautiful. So thank you for your comments. And it's wonderful to, to follow off on that. So what does proximity mean and what does environment mean? And, and I go very deeply into, into concepts in my thinking. How do people, when people talk about the environment, what do they actually mean by that? And how, how large is their environment? Does it include the, the tree outside their house and their garden, which is certainly an environment? Are the bees in that garden? Or do they start thinking about the neighborhood? Or do they start thinking about, then you can, you can you know, figure out all the levels of the, the world. And if you haven't gone to the planetar planetarium, they have, they have some um, experimental um, programs after their scientists reporting on their research, and they do the Atlas of the Universe. And you start to feel very, very little, and time seems amazing. <coughs> you just start to see where the earth. You've ever done it? Has anybody here done that? It's, it's just an amazing experience to sort of place yourself. It's so <coughs> overwhelming. And so how do people place themselves in, in the world? And, and of course, their lives are going on in... Um, it's not a snapshot. We're moving through time all the time, and as you pointed out, things are constantly changing. So I think our notion of what environment is and is evolving construct, and it's been evolving um, in just in our own lives over time. 40th Earth Day. I, re I remember the. I don't know how, how many people remember the first one. <laughs> Some of us do. And it was it was quite it was really quite a sea change. It was a few years after Rachel Carson's book. And so things were changing then, and I think they've been changing on and on. And the things that we now include in the scope of justice weren't there, and, and then we see degradation. I see this so the scope of justice are the things that we don't even think about that both that we consider important and worthy of our attention, of our protection, and of our willingness to somehow engage with them. And I started that research looking at a beetle for a whole lot of reasons, because beetles are unpopular, and if you can figure out how you can get people to engage with beetles, then you can figure out how to get them to engage with a whole lot of things that are not popular. But under what circumstances, is my question, people engage with that beetle, or with the earth as a whole, or with black bears, or trees, as, as Bob Summer does in his research, as you do in your, in your art. Um, one of my studies was about uh, engaging with a mouse, Right. All right, so um, there's an interesting question about disposition that you're raising, Dan, about whether you know, Katie sort of grew up in an environment that was similar to the environment of the rest of your family, and yet everyone took this different paths, and so we had the individual and who they are dispositionally in, in their lives. I'm sure you all know people who are close to you who you're very different from them, nevertheless. And then we we try to look at in, in my in my view I'm trying to look at what in the context is changing. So it goes back to the question of is environment changing, is scope of justice changing? What do we mean by that? And so your question now and I'll leap from that because I could talk about it all night. But my answer would be yes, everything is changing. It's just do we notice it? Um, because what are, okay, I'll just go back. Earth Day, what Earth Day did is I think was it expanded people's scope of justice. So that, for example, a hundred years ago we, we did whaling without a, a second thought. People did it for a livelihood. And now that's not considered a cool thing to do. And um, people have gotten very sophisticated about what's no longer cool. I think that global warming or climate change or however, you know, those are very different views of the same thing. Um, people have become much more sophisticated about carbon footprints and what I do and how I make choices. And that's been quite different if you think back over even your life over the last five years, how you think about what you should do with the environment. Um, so I'm very interested in what, if, what it is about the context that makes us all change. And your question is being near, okay? And so I think that's a really important thing because things we see and can touch 
and understand what they are visually, as well as tactically, as well as conceptually, are something we're much more likely to include in our scope of justice, but not only. For example, a lot of people are afraid of bats or snakes, or you know, people react differently to different kinds of creatures. So it's not just proximity. Um, I don't want to take up all, all too much time, but I want to say that in my when I started working on the natural world in my work, almost all the research in, in psychology, and David Litter, you can back me up on this, um, from Princeton University as well, um, talked about the built environment. That there was in the 70s this tremendous interest in psychology on how was being in particular kinds of spaces matter to us. And so they were talking about work environment, living environment, environment the schools, hospitals, and all the built environment, how that affected lives and relationships. And so I was like, well, what about the natural world? And so I started to look at nature through bugs. And um, since then, there's been a tremendous interest in the natural environment. But I've gone the other way, to be contrary, perhaps, and to, well, what if we took the environment and we didn't make the, the distinction between nature and physical, because in fact, it's a very, very funny line. You can say, well, I know that building is built, and I know that this park, but is the park built too? And the whole idea of Cronin is that there's the end of nature. We've, we've changed the weather systems. We've changed everything. So there's nothing that we haven't really touched with our hands, and it's just a question of what's more green. What you're saying about missing green in New York. Um, but just, if we just kind of smush those categories together and talk about how being around physical things is different than social relationships and what physical things matter and when and why, it raises really interesting questions. So that's where my work is right now in the paper that I'm writing that's just out for review, um, looking at the way the environment's been conceptualized over 75 years of research and to see what is physical meant, what is environment meant. And so I think, to answer your question, I think it does matter, but not always, because being near could, could create fear as well as closeness. But I do want to say that I think that in terms of being in the city, this is just personal, I need to see views. We're very, so much, uh, even in the suburbs, very much we see a block, we see it across the street, we see not very far, but if you go over a bridge, you can suddenly see far away, or you're taking a walk with the ocean, or you're standing on the top of the mountain. There's something about that expanse, I guess it brings you back to the planetarium, that's very, very exciting, and that gives, some, gives us perspective. Well, that, um, two things about that. I mean, there's, first, about the, about the idea of the view, and the, and the sort of gut need to have that view. And I know this, this uh, ties into some some theories, some psychological theories that are related very much to uh, the connection between the mind and nature, that uh, we have, um, having lived on the African plain for thousands and thousands and thousands of years before the rise of civilizations, uh, we are predisposed to want certain certain views, that our minds have been, have been constructed in a certain way to be able to be above and high above things. Uh, so that you can see predators coming, say. Uh, of course, completely unprovable. You can't do scientific studies, but uh, but fits into the idea that there is. Um, I mean, your work very much deals with uh, the uh, sort of almost conscious decisions that people make, um, or some, not all. I know it's on the border. Uh, whereas uh, some of the ideas that come out of what I in my introduction when I was talking about is the. Is this idea that there is a that there is a uh, an innate core that relates that in which the mind needs a certain relationship to healthy nature in order to uh, have the optimal function? But uh, but before going to that, I, I think this is it's useful from here to pass the baton to Chad um, uh, because the work that you're doing now is 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 how people's concepts of the natural environment have changed over the course of decades, uh, which is uh, a very individual or group level way of thinking about things. And I know Chad's work uh, has taken from a more um, from political economy point of view. Uh, and in that way has been a lot more uh, well pessimistic, if, if I'm using that word. I mean, the, the 
it, I was rereading everybody's work in Chad's um, is uh, perhaps the most pained of everybody's. Um, there are lots of ideas in there. I'll just you know a couple of quotes. Um, very beautiful quotes. One, our, he wrote, uh, Our way of life that used to seem so durable takes on a sad valedictory aspect, the way life does for any 19th century protagonist on his way to a duel that began as a petty misunderstanding. Our world is passing from us. Um, and uh, another one, Our, is our isolation grow will grow as millions of fellow species become extinct. Uh, and I think... Uh, um, Oh, and, and one more, it's even more related, if you don't mind, just because I think they're nice. <laughs> the impression, he was talking about uh, all the reporting that we see on global warming, which there's tons of more every day. The impression that this makes on our consciousnesses, our consciousness, rather, remains a dangerously shallow one. There remains an eerie discrepancy between the scope of the problem and our attention to it. And I think that this um, sort of valedictory, to use his word, uh, aspect of, of Chad's work grows out of, and correct me if I'm wrong, an emphasis on the institutional aspect of the problem. Uh, that our problems, as much as we might pay attention to our carbon footprint or um, you know, and buy more Priuses, uh, the fundamental system isn't changing. And so it's not going to do anyone really a great deal of good so far as protecting the environment is concerned. And therefore, maybe making us somewhat complicit. So I'm, I'm curious, because in, um, a lot of this work was done when you were in the middle of writing your first novel, which was your first work. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you turned to this problem of, of uh, the environment and the natural world, uh, and if it, if it was done out of a sort of need, or, or, and, and why you took that perspective. Wow. That was, that was a quick question, Dan. I know, I'm sorry, that was multi-part, I apologize. Um, you can say whatever you'd like. <laughs> and I will. Um, that, um, uh, yeah, political economy. So, well, so, I mean, as Dan mentioned in my introduction, I'm one of the editors of a, of a small magazine called Endless One, which, uh, the first issue of which came out in the summer of 2004. Uh, and it was started by me and, and four friends of mine um, uh, and it was started for it's a you know it's a journal of literature and politics and culture, um, and we had there were there were things about the kind of public conversation about literature and about politics uh, that we felt were really wrong or lacking when we started the magazine, and that was and these the you know these these things that we these gaps were the impetus for the magazine. Um, in particular, politically, uh, we were very upset about the left's reaction to the run-up of the Iraq war um, and we you know we felt that uh, we felt that uh, you know the left was in large part kind of supporting the war and, and uh, we felt that was very bad <laughs> and, we were, and we were very angry and we felt that this we felt that this point of view was, was kind of surprisingly underrepresented um, but something that was kind of really missing from our worldview as a group at that time I think was a sort of uh, understanding of environmental problems and ecological problems in the way that these in the way that these play into our politics. And you know, if you look at the first first three issues of N plus one, we deal with a lot of things, but uh, that is really uh, that's really absent from it. Um, and you know, so for me, I think I'd always had a sort of background interest in environmental questions, and I, for some reason, Thoreau was a writer who kind of really grabbed me at a, at a relatively early age. And uh, I, was, I think I just I had a sort of background interest in these things. I remember I was I, I used to, I used to love Al Gore because in the uh, you know, Earth and the Balance, the book that he wrote maybe in 1989 or so, I thought was I thought it was fantastic that a you know a vice presidential candidate had written this fantastic book, and I read it. And, um, but um, but these things sort of laid in the background until around 2005, when uh, I was suddenly just sort of gripped <coughs> by the urgency of these problems. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, kind of uh, the growing awareness of global warming and kind of the major crisis that global warming posed uh, was probably the impetus for that. Um, and really, I just, and so I just sort of read a book on the subject and was totally, you know, terrified and, uh, and frightened, and I, I, and I suddenly I could so basically suddenly I could do nothing except read books about global warming. 
Um, and I did this for several months, and uh, I would I would go to parties, and people would just try to talk to me. <laughs> and I'd be like, there are six major greenhouse gases. <laughs> and uh, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and uh, you know, so, and so out of this out, out of this grew my first piece for Plus One on the subject, which was just which was a kind of long essay about global warming and our kind of like cultural and political reactions to global warming. Um, and this, uh, and, you know, you mentioned political economy, and, and I do think that this um, uh, the, these environmental questions uh, ultimately really kind of radicalized my own politics and to some extent the politics of the magazine. Um, because after having read all this stuff and then kind of expanding from global warming to read a bunch of other sort of environmental literature, uh, you know, I, I, I found myself wondering why we were why we were so unwilling to do anything about it. Um, you know, because the you know the, the scientific consensus about the you know about the direness of global warming has, I think, you know. At the, late, the latest that you could peg that to would be 1995 in the NAS conference of that year. You know, so it's been a long time that we've known what's going on, and yet, and yet the problem seems seems totally intractable. Um, and you know, so this is this is what uh, you know. I was reading economists and some of my other my fellow editors were you know reading economists and, and political theorists to try to figure this out, and uh, it uh, and it just it came to seem that. Um, you know, that our economic arrangements are just, are just kind of direly and, and sort of diametrically opposed to uh, you know to the needs of the environment. Um, and the only thinkers that I could find who were really giving any kind of uh, of solid account of environmental degradation and why that and why we couldn't do anything about it were really were were, were Marxists essentially. Um, that answers part of your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that answers at least uh, part of my question. So, um, uh, moving on to Robert. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, who has a different, uh, not, not to bring too many issues into the, into play here, but uh, what I wanted to ask you is that uh, you know, a lot of your work seems to play with the idea of this boundary between the natural world and uh, this modern consumer uh, uh, world uh, explicitly. Uh, and I mean, it seems to me that you're often trying to break down the boundary between nature and civilization, town and country, the woods and the city, whatever, uh, however you want to put it. Um, and in a way, I read your work as, a, as very optimistic. Um, uh, and, and maybe wrong, but. Uh, because you seem to always being able to find, uh, to locate this, the natural world in places that anyone else would see as extremely degraded. Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about whether you agree with that premise that environmental problems are almost certain to have a negative effect on the mind, whether you think that there is a, a way out. Um, ah, so. Uh, I just I, I, I've been through the, the I'm, I'm the kind of person who was at the party and we probably would have, you know maybe hugged and said yeah that many gases I know and, <laughs> but I, I might have made a joke about Marx and you know like Groucho Marx or something and it's really where the hope is uh, to as well and in addition to the other Marx um, uh, because well, I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad somebody's reading uh, reading me optimistically, because um, sometimes when I'm writing, it's you know it's not it doesn't feel that optimistic. But um, well, I'll I'll say um, I'll say I'll say this. I'll say first, uh, thanks for letting me come to New Rochelle. I'm so excited. I grew up in Queens, and um, so we, we were landlocked, and there were still <laughs> some there were still some farms. My father remembered the farms. We still bought from a farm. I bought corn from a farm in Queens. And one day, I remember a turtle came through our town. The same turtles that stopped JFK planes landing recently, if you remember. And it came through our town. It was the biggest event ever. And, but anyway, we'd get in a car once in a while and drive to see uh, my grandmother and our cousins. My grandmother was in New Rochelle. Um, my cousins were in Larchmont. And, you know, kind of like today, I mean, from Queens we'd go 
uh, you know, over the glacial, uh, where the glacier stopped and made a hill, uh, we go over that and catch um, probably the white stone bridge with a frog's neck. And just the words, right? Frog's neck. Raise your hand if you've been on Frog's Neck Bridge. Raise your hand on Frog's Neck. Thank you. Frog's Neck, right? What does it mean? What does it come from, right? It's a neck of land. Named for a guy named Frog's. There was a ferry there. Um, pretty exciting. But you go over and you'd see this view. It was so... You, you can inhale the views in New York, as you know. I mean, views are therapeutic for me. I, I just don't know if it's for everybody, but... It's, it's really true. Um, and, and anyway, then, then you know, we turn, we come up your, up your neck here, the neck of Westchester, and we come to New Rochelle, we visit my grandmother in an apartment, there were a kind of beetles, are roaches beetles? I just remember the, the roaches, oh my god. I'd never seen them before. And uh, we try to help her with that, and then, um, and then we go to Larchmont, where my cousins live, in a big house called the Manor House, it was a colonial house, and it was um, where apparently there's an underground railroad stop, and they'd lock me in those rooms that were underground railroad rooms, hidden rooms, and I'm, I'm, I'm over that through dealing with being locked in those rooms, but we come down, they live right on the water, and we come to um, what you could tell, you, I can now, I now know we're salt marsh, kind uh, of salt marshy coves up in here, and so we came to the water, and, and it was so exciting to go over the water and come down to the water. And so to come to do a show at Larchmont, and then my grandmother died, there was a reception at the, at the Larchmont Yacht Club, and I just thought, wow, I'm related to somebody, you know, living in Queens, I'm related to somebody who died near water. And it was it's just <laughs> it was great. It was great. It was really, really great. So um, I think, but I'm going to make sure I get, so the question is really, you know, is, is there hope in the situation? That, you know, the, yeah, well, it wasn't the most clearly phrased question. No, but the question but was... Well, I mean, I think your optimism is already well, you know, yeah. pretty clear uh, that, uh, you know, and the idea that you would sort of say, you know, I like both Marxes. Uh, well, yeah, but, I, but, I, but I, it drives me crazy, the disconnect that we're talking about, the disconnect we're talking about with, with you know, why, since 95 we've known this. I mean, I remember being, you know, out of college and, and reading about the Green Party in Germany and, and reading about... Um, uh, you know, governments in, in Northern Europe saying, let's sit down, you know, ministers of cabinets will sit down, we'll try to organize the economy in such a way that it'll be left. And I'm thinking, you know, it's 1984, 80, 85, and I'm thinking, yeah, and we'll, we'll be doing this soon too here. We'll be, we'll be doing that kind of stuff. We, we've got to be. And, and you're always kind of finding these things that make you so optimistic. And, you know, but now, now I live in a neighborhood where, you know, it's, it's, it's in Brooklyn, where, where my father was born before he moved to the country in, in Queens, uh, in, you know, 1930. Um, so so I, I live in a neighborhood where everybody is green. Everybody loves the earth so much. They, everybody loves the earth so much. So I'm showing the, I'm showing the unoptimistic side. I'm showing the horrible person side. Okay, ready? The horrible person side. Everybody loves the environment. They are so in touch with the environment. Because um, they'll say to me, because I'm the guy saying, hey, you want to count the greenhouse gases with me? And they're so annoyed by that. I know that, but I can't. My wife tells me to stop, so I stop. But anyway, you know, my, you know, my daughter's like, please, Dad, don't come in the room. But anyway, the son's gone to college. It's fine for him now. But anyway, you know, the, the, we love the environment, too. Bob, you're, you're like green, right? You wrote about Thoreau, and you, you have a canoe. You're green. We love, we, we love, you know, I'm serious, I'm serious. we love the environment, and we just came back from this resort um, in the Bahamas. It's eco. We went to an eco resort, and and you know, we we parked our car at JFK for a week, and and paid eight thousand dollars. I don't even know how you do it, but um, and it was great. And we know it's great because name of famous writer who's eco. You know, I'm not, you know, was there. They tell me. And, and, and I'm just, I'm saying, you know, and, you know, I feel like such a loser. You know, I, 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 I have no car, you know, and it's not a political statement, really. I can't afford the insurance, and drive, parking drives me nuts. And I'm still parking, even though I don't have a car. Like, right now, I'm thinking what spaces are free in my neighborhood, even though I don't have a car. Because parking is so hard. Like, you know. And I, I, I ride a bike, and I realize, you know, and people say you're nuts because you're riding a bike. I'm, you know, and you're some kind of insane, you know, Thoreauian freak. I'm not, it's fun to ride a bike. You know, my pop rode a bike just because it was easy. He just got on the bike and rode the bike across town. I mean, so it's, it's all this stuff is no brainer stuff. It's not radical stuff. So, so it drives me crazy and insanely sort of you know, in an unoptimistic way. So my, I've always felt that my kind of um, 
you know, way is how can I point out that that the built environment and the non-built environment are, are, are the exact same thing, you know, and how can I point out that being eco has to do with economics um, and the tree museum, uh, it's, it's too bad we don't have a two hour thing for just for a spotlight on me um, to point to Katie's pictures of tree museum to tell about how great it is because it, it, it's amazing that it broke down this idea of what's What's nature and what's not nature? What does a tree mean anyway? What are the roots? But but so I, I'm always looking at word roots because I wish I were a scholar and I'm not a scholar. And I think that scholars look at word roots. And I made sure my kids both know Greek and Latin. And they both know Greek and Latin. And I think eco is is uh, anybody a Greek? Uh, can we raise your hand for Greek. We have a Greek scholar in the house, please. Anybody? Emergency Greek? No. I think eco eco means house. And you know it's there in ecology because this is our home, and it's there in economics because this is how we take care of our home. And environment, I think, is Latin. Please, any Latin scholars? Come on, it's got to be Latin so, No. Okay. So Latin. Like, I should, I can, we can get my daughter on cell phone. Latin. Uh, you know, environment. The root of it is to see around you, to to see around. And so these things change all the time. And when I when I wrote the Thoreau book, which was a mistake, but I had to do it. I had to get out of myself. I was saying this before we got, went on mic. Um, but when I wrote, wrote the Thoreau book, um, you know, I, I looked at Thoreau and I looked at how people thought of him. Did they think of him first as a nature writer? No, actually, he was considered to be writing about economics, and he was writing about how, and he was kind of cranky about how um, his town, everybody was cutting down the trees. In fact, here's an amazing thing about Thoreau. Okay, if you do, do you know Walden and Walden Pond, the, the book Walden, everybody thinks Walden beautiful. Um, quiet guy, you know, writing uh, notes in his journal uh, with a coffee mug that, you know, has a whale on it because he's, he's, he's in touch with nature. People are thinking this guy's incredibly in touch with nature and he's writing the journal. He's saying, I love it when I have coffee in the woods. It's so quiet. It's great. And so that's nature, right? Right? So get this. Get this. This is the most astounding fact to me about Thoreau. Thoreau writes Walden at the peak of deforestation in New England. So guess what? There are no trees in Thoreau's landscape. He's writing in a woodlot. They've saved some trees. Emerson bought it for fuel. If you're a minister in Concord, Massachusetts, you're paid partly in wood because they're running out of trees. So, so, so what makes me sad is that that you know since '95 we sit around. It makes me so unoptimistic. But what makes me hopeful is the woods that Thoreau was in. Um, have come back. The second growth. I, I, I wrote the story about this Harvard Forest guy, Drex in Harvard Forest, such a cool guy. The second growth woods that exist where Thoreau was, where we are, that stretch to Ohio, that go down to Virginia, this second growth wood has a um, carbon, to use the technical phrase, carbon sucking power. It's a technical phrase. That, that is, that when the spring tree, when the green out, the great green out happens, as this green out is happening right now, they're noticing in you know, Hawaii at the National Atmospheric you know, NOAA's, uh, where they're checking out the carbon budget of the entire atmosphere. Our trees here that were cut down once and grew back, but of course are being strip mauled away, except for this brief pause in the recession. Those woods are sucking more now than they were 50 years ago. So that's really hopeful. But my, and I'll stop here. I'll try to stop. <laughs> my my goal then, my, my thing is, my what I have to deal with is, since I have no um, portfolio, no you know, no expertise, I'm not an artist, I'm a guy who rides a, a crummy bicycle, I would like a nicer bicycle, around my neighborhood <laughs> and, and grumbles because you know, because I'm making fun of um, I'm saying there they're buying like, eco chips at the giant chain store and I'm a horrible person. I'm a horrible, horrible person. Because I should just enjoy it. I just, I'm just be happy. But so I try to sort of, tr I'm trying to make a trick. I'm trying to set something up. I'm trying to say, oh, come with me to this most disgusting place. Oh, let's talk about rats and how horrible they are. And maybe I can show you how they're actually, you know what? They're a lot like those other creatures that they live next to that I like to eat fatty foods and go down to holes in the ground every day. And come back. <laughs> so, so it's a joke, but. And then the last thing I'll say is, is um, when I wrote the Meadowlands book, I was so excited. I go on radio programs around the country. I love radio, first of all. Second of all, um, invariably, if I go on a calling program, 
uh, women would call into the station. I mean, don't worry, men would call too, and it wasn't like, you know, I'm not saying it. But, but my wife had told me when I was writing the swamp book about the dumps down at the swamp and how she would go with her father to the dump. And she loved to go to her father to the dump. And can I tell you that I got so many calls from people who said, I used to love, women would call and I used to love to go to the dump with my father. And this was a great thing. And, and so I'm stopping here by saying that that what I think is really amazing is how inspired, you can meet people at the most disgusting, trash-filled, you know, ravine, and there are people down there thinking about fishing, um, or, or just want to stand there at the sunset and look at it. And that power, that power of, of any landform, really, but that power is, you know, amazing. So that, that's, I'm very optimistic about that. And as you can see, you never want to live near me because the, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the sort of great sucking power of the the Harvard forest. That's not the Black Rock forest, well, right? They've done the experiments at the Harvard Experimental Forest to show that the entire Northeast uh, right woods. Well, that forest, notwithstanding, I mean, the whole idea because there is an optimistic idea that um, if you if you go to a place where kids are only have an abandoned lot to play in, they will migrate toward weeds, dirt patches, and so on, and they will play in them. But, uh, and I promised Susan I wasn't going to bring up the work of this um, psychologist who she anthologized in her book uh, named Peter Kahn, but Peter Kahn uh, uh, has talked about uh, the danger of, I, I forgot what he calls it, but uh, the, base, the basic idea is that the shifting baseline. Uh, kids everywhere, no matter where you go, are going to have a certain moral outlook about nature. Polluting is bad, um, uh, uh, green things are good. That actually seems to be there if you go to the rainforest or if you go to uh, uh, off the Grand Con Con Concourse in the Bronx. But, um, but the problem that other people have, have laid out uh, is that as you um, move forward, as you degrade the environment, you come of age thinking that the swamp the, 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 the lot is, uh, is what nature is. Yeah. Uh, and sure, there are instances like Thoreau's where it was at the peak of deforestation and now things have recovered to some extent, but by and large, as strip malls tell us, uh, the baseline is going right. down. And the, and the question, I mean, I don't know who wants to answer this, is, is uh, you know, whether this poses a sort of, uh, not just a behavioral threat, not just a threat to the world, but actually, you know, to, 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 to bring it back to the psychological threat. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to respond. I just want to say about um, about children and the baseline, and and you know, this is hard. And um, and so when I'm, when I'm the way I'm kind of approaching things is, I mean, it is that um, you know, how, this, this is kind of reverse uh, idea that I like to be in, and it's, it's if you, you can care about this, this most beautiful, pristine forest, uh, and you can give money to that and say, it's great, we should protect that, but, um, but it's like, um, what about the least of your landscapes, you know? You, the, you know, they always say that the measure, I mean, something you hear is the, the measure of a society, how, how great a society is, is how well it treats it, its least powerful uh, constituents, and so there is this idea of, um, you know, that, that's kind of part of what I'm talking about, is, is how can you, uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about the most degraded part, and will you stand up for that, and who will? Because if you're standing up for that, if you're saving the ecology of a, dis, of a totally screwed up watershed, the Bronx River is an amazing story, okay? It's an amazing story. If you're standing up for that, that is, uh, that's a lot. But, but, that, but what you're talking about in terms of lowering the bar for kids, I mean, so who wants to <laughs> I can just say something about, because I, I worked with a lot of kids and in a lot of schools in the Bronx. Um, the South Bronx is around the Grand Concourse, so you probably know the area. So I was in probably in six, seven, eight schools, I don't know, and, um, that, and also just kids in the street and in the parks. And uh, a lot of them told me that the trees should just be chopped down because they're in the way. So, I don't know, just when you said something about we have this notion even from when we're little, but it's good. I was meeting little people, and they didn't. I wasn't getting that. How 
old were they? Five at all. Um, it was probably the teenagers who were telling me that, something younger than that. Yeah. They're probably just everything's a blur. The, the little, little kids would draw, um, they all drew pictures for me, and the pictures were amazing. Because, you know, where I grew up, we all just drew a tree and a little house and a sun in the sky. And that was it. And like the horizon line, I was talking about the horizon line. And then when these kids draw their picture, you have the horizon line, but then there are huge skyscrapers and millions of people. And like our pictures never had people, or maybe two, like the, the mummy and the daddy holding hands um, under the tree. But they had like millions of people, big huge skyscrapers and uh, airplanes in the sky. Um, so it's just, it really struck me, the kids really didn't see the tree as being alive or um, it was just another like stick. You have the lamppost, and you have the trash can, and you have the car, and you have a tree, and it's just something that you pull the bark off. Uh, there's a, um, I mean, another question here. Uh, Susan, do you have do you have kids? Yeah. Okay, so so we have two people who have kids, and you know that well. And and Chad and I were talking about this a little bit because, uh, and Robert, this goes to you as well. You, you have two kids, and. Uh, it's an extremely optimistic thing to do if something, if you are fearful for what uh, they may, they might not have, um, and if you are aware of this shifting baseline problem, if you're aware of all the environmental problems. Uh, um, uh, I mean, maybe Chad, this is for you because one thing we were talking about how this this question of of um, of, of suffering at the hands of and, and struggling with these questions. Of, of the state of the earth are, are not necessarily new. Uh, that these were things that happened during the height of the Cold Age, for, uh, of the Cold War, rather. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can talk a little to that. And sort of the, the question of, do you invest in the future with, with children? I mean, at this point, it's a... Do you want me to tell them whether, whether they should have children? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should leave the advice part out of it. Um, well, I mean, I mean, I feel... As I think maybe the only parent is I, I neither have children nor am I married, and I may be the only. That's quite good. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, so you know I don't. I, but you know, but I'm, I'm of an age where uh, I nonetheless start to think about these things. Um, it's I mean I, I I mean you know I to prevent myself from having to talk about this, I'm going to read a quote. Dan. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's fair. Because you mentioned that, uh, because you mentioned that you, you, because uh, when Dan and I were talking about the panel beforehand, we were talking about about the about the Cold War, um, and I was talking about some of the ways in which you know I think that a lot of kind of valuable thinking about how to think about this world that we live in, a world of kind of you know of impending ecological catastrophe. Uh, it's a, it's it's of course, people have been worried about environmental problems for a very long time, for hundreds of years. Um, but I think that the idea that we really are kind of presently immersed in a catastrophe um, is something which has come up very recently, and which previous generations uh, did not spend a lot of time thinking about that. They, they, you know, environmental problems were regional, or you know, they they were smaller in scope than the way that we think of these things now. Um, you know, and so I think that uh, the people who were thinking about nuclear war um, in the fifties and sixties and seventies and the eighties, uh, you know, were kind of were, were thinking about these things in a, in a philosophical way that um, is really useful to us now. Um, and as I was, and when we were talking about the topic of the panel, it made me think of, of Jonathan Shell's book, uh, *The Fate of the Earth*, which I think was published in. 1982, and it came out of a series of essays that he wrote for the New Yorker about nuclear disarmament, um, and which I think kind of speaks to, which I think kind of speaks to the situation. If you just you know to take the words nuclear weapons and replace them with you know environmental uh, damage or something like that, um, when one tries to face the nuclear predicament, one feels sick, whereas when one pushes it out of mind, as apparently one must do most of the time in order to carry on with life, one feels well again. But this feeling of well-being is based on a denial of the most important reality of our time, and therefore is itself a kind of sickness. A society that systematically shuts its eyes to an urgent peril to its physical survival and fails to take any steps to save itself cannot be called psychologically well. In effect, whether we think about nuclear weapons or avoid thinking about them, 
Their presence among us makes us sick, and there seems to be little of a purely mental or emotional nature that we can do about it. Um, I think that's a pretty nice formulation of the, of the problem, and I think it speaks to, you know, one, one problem that people who think about ecological things, or you're, often, you're often faced with uh, the charge that you are a grim and no fun sort of person. I never, I never said that about you. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your blog, Dan. Uh, and they, you know, and uh, you know, and what Shell is saying is that well, this, um, this, uh, these problems work on you in some way, even if you're not active, even if you're not thinking about them. I mean, there's a, there's, I mean, there's something kind of freeing about that sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't formulation of it because you. I mean, I certainly, I certainly felt, you know, uh, I certainly felt when I, when I, when I really started to investigate these problems, I think that I had uh, the, uh, an initial kind of surge of, of good feeling, in the sense that, like, you know, my, uh, some of my former denial was, like, uh, kind of uh, being taken away from me, you know, and so I would go to the party, and uh, I, would, I, would, I would name the greenhouse gases, and, you know, someone would say to me, well, Chad, isn't it horribly depressing to think about this stuff all the time? And uh, I think I, I think for at least at certain times I'm taken aback by that question because um, I'm you know because I think well it's it's it can, it's kind of terrifying to live in this world, but it's not necessarily so terrifying to think about it. Um, there's that in this, you know the same way that um, people spoke of you know there are a lot of Shell and you know and a lot of artists and Don DeLillo as a novelist comes to mind. People who kind of represented the kind of uh, just the, the anxiety, you know, that living in a world with nuclear weapons brought on. Um, you know, I think there's a kind of generalized anxiety, you know, having to do with ecological crisis. Um, and so, you, and it doesn't necessarily make me any less cheerful, um, and it doesn't necessarily make me any more depressed to think about it than not to think about it. But what you're left with after uh, sort of shedding the denial, I mean, shedding the sense that you're just walking through your days consciously or, I mean, actively not thinking about uh, the fact that we're existing in this age of, of, of environmental catastrophe is a sense of powerlessness. I mean, uh, always powerlessness. I mean, this is what we're talking about to some extent. You can do certain things, but uh, given the scope of the problem, uh, as, as we said on the phone, I mean, we're not we're sitting here talking, we're not chained to oil tankers. Uh, I mean, if we were chained to oil tankers, they would just disconnect us from the oil tankers and throw us in Rikers Island. Uh, I mean, do you feel that? Do you, I mean, does anyone want to speak to that? And at this point, I'd also like to open up, uh, since we're running time for uh, questions from the audience. But Susan. I want to respond to that, because I'm really interested in the notion of denial, and when we, when we deny, when we engage in these issues. And, you know, the people who are here, and, and you guys too, are people who have sort of taken the moment to say, let's think about these things. These are really important things. And their problems are just so huge. You know, that I think that a lot of people won't engage the question among among you know scholars and I think like many psychologists who are interested in the environment is what gets people motivated to address the issues. And there's a sense, you know, that they're so big, what what difference can I make? And, and then there's a sense of helplessness, and helplessness then leads to a sense of depression and, and all the anxiety and all the things. We, the word anxiety is a lot tonight. Um, and I have to say that I think that, that it's an unusual group here, that we're not typical of normal people, that we're really willing to engage and think about things that are pretty, can be pretty catastrophic. If you saw Paul Fruntman's article in the, the, the Times Magazine about the economics, he thinks it's, he's, I think, profoundly optimistic while being very wide-eyed about what the problems are of trying to get carbon, what's the word? Whatever. Yeah. Down. <laughs> get carbon down, yeah. yeah. And how the United States can, yes, and how the United States can induce China to also cooperate. And that's a really interesting question. And it actually goes back to nuclear deterrence, when how we didn't get Russia to cooperate with the United States in reducing atomic weapons. So I think people who have lived through that Cold War era may have a lot of deja vu. I was, I mean, actually, you asked me about. Um, this. I mean, the thing I really thought about was how hard it was to decide.
decide whether or not to have children yeah. at one point, because I really thought that the future was really going to be pretty bad. And I thought I could live out my life okay, but I didn't know how far ahead that would continue. And what, what the idea about children is so interesting, because it forces us to think in larger chunks than we normally think. So all of a sudden, you're thinking general, general, generationally. And I don't think we tend to think that way. And I, that's been always a problem, that people won't really care about or, to use my own phrase, include in the scope of justice future generations. We simply can't envision them, relate to them, talk to them, and in some ways they can't matter. So having kids is an affirmative act, I think, of just saying, well, I've made do, I've sort of found my way. The future will always have challenges. Every generation has had challenges. Very few haven't lived through some war or some terrible thing, and they're just going to have to to find ways to make it work. Um, so but what I'm interested in um, now is the way that the younger generation has become very, very interested in the local, in the garden. Now food is being grown in people's backyards. City roofs are being used to grow food. We're thinking about the environment in kind of ways that are proactive and very local. And that's, I think, very beautiful. Um, in California, there's things online where people mark on maps where there is free fruit for the picking kind of a cooperative thing rather than have it fall on the ground and be lost. And so there are these cooperative local endeavors in all kinds of ways. I mean, Boy Scouts and 4-H groups and youth groups have been testing water in many parts of, of, the, um, of where they live. And so how people are interacting with these things has nothing to do with whether they're urban or rural, whether it's the built environment that they live in or it's more natural. But they're finding ways to engage with the environment. I mean, right now we're breathing. It's like air. So we're always interacting with the environment. So um, I love the way that, the, I'm very interested in the way the youth today are finding ways to do that. The food movement is huge in schools. And public schools use their little yards, which used to be just dirt, for planting vegetables and corn. And, and thinking about where things grow and where they come from. I find that all very exciting. Whether it will help on a large scale, I don't even know that I want to wrap my mind around that, or I'm going to become. Right. Anxious and, <laughs> and that's the balance. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, uh, speaking of the youth, uh, does any of the youth have, have questions for the panelists? Or non youth? I'll get it on the non youth. Back to smart. Non youth. Um, I was very interested. My question when I walked in would have been about denial, but you seem um, already um, prepared to talk about denial. So maybe um, it's a uh, question with, with um, greater stakes or amplitude. I'm thinking of, my brother happens to be a, a lawyer for the Bureau of Land Management in Utah, my home state. And one of the things that he's been contending with recently is um, the county commissioners in, I think it's Kane County, but don't write that in your blog, so I might be wrong. But these are folks who live um, near the Escalante staircase, a wilderness area designated by President Clinton in his, in his last moments, much to the chagrin of, of some of the residents. And as part of a, I guess you'd call it the sovereignty movement at the moment, Kane County commissioners drive their all-terrain vehicles across um, the wilderness to demonstrate their ability to do so and invite, invite others to do the same. So I just use that as an illustration of something that goes beyond denial, which seems to be a kind of aggressive um, opposition um, to awareness or action, even to awareness, even to articulation of um, the scope of, of um, what we without blinking, call uh, an age of ecological destruction, environmental destruction. You know, th those are fighting words in some uh, counties in Utah and elsewhere. So I'm wondering if, I mean, maybe I watch too much Fox News and listen to too much WABC, but there's a kind of choir-to-choir -choir conversation that isn't happening, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that. I, I think there's a lot of hostility, and, and then just the way abortion is it, is it like issue that gal galvanizes that the environment does too. There's a lot of um, violent acts in yeah. those kinds of conflicts. And they're of concern because they are acts that kind of affirm with each group's identity yeah. and in ways that dig in deeper and deeper. And it's really important to work across. And the ways that that needs to be done through cooperative endeavors, basically through cooperative processes, um, are you know need to be developed better. And I think Definitely, the environment has become a very powerful moral issue, and that makes it even harder to cross bridges because when values are involved, it seems almost as if people keep digging themselves in. 
And yet there are ways, and the, that's why the research on conflict resolution is so interesting. What Deutsch's work is wonderful, and it is actually on nuclear deterrence, but it can be applied to this too. And I think that we need to find ways to talk to and listen to people we don't agree with and actually hear what they have to say, and it needs to happen one-on-one -on -one and group by group, et cetera. But the knitting together of this country politically is going to be a huge, huge job. We've, I think we've just gotten more and more polarized over, over my my. I just think that I just think yeah. I, I just think that um, to, and finding commonalities. I mean, I'm, you know, if you put me into the category that says, you know, I, I'm ecologically aware, or whatever, I love the environment, I would never ride my vehicle or all terrain vehicle across. But um, but you know, so somebody in Washington or someone out of state is saying something. This, I mean, the the thing that they have that has to be respected is they live there. It's right. that it's there. Land. You can say it's all our land, and you can say it's public land, and, and you know the government funds them to ranch it and all that stuff. But that's the place they live in. And, and if you get word, rid of the word environment, because why we don't need it, we don't need the word environment. And then you've got that Fox News uh, broadcast gone. And um, but I just and I just want to say, and here's a question. Here's another question. So I'm going to let you ask the question. But I just want to say that um, you know I, I have a silly answer, but it's not silly. Um, why have kids? Because they're going to change the world. They are going to change the world. And I, I am not, I'm not, my kids, I mean, you know how it is about your kids, so you can't listen to anything your parents says about the kids, but they're going to change the world. And I'm doing a story about now, now about buses. How unenvironmental does that sound? But numbers of people moved in a direction. And one person who might be a teenager now and grows up to, you know, know not to say environment and whatever, get elected or become head of buses and put billion buses in New York rather than cars and put in bus lanes and completely con reconfigure the city and make it less carbon emitting. That suddenly you have one person, I think we're seeing so much now that one person can make so much of a difference. So I guess I'm optimistic. Yeah, I was just going to say, what's the question? Well, the question, I said this is not a question, it's a comment. Um, I have to say that I'm not as sanguine as either you or Susan are, but I think that the question is about climate change. And I think that there are ways to get at it. I don't think we found commonalities on the health care bill. I don't think we're going to find it in financial reform. I don't think we're going to find it here. Um, and Dan, I think it was a little bit, I mean, I don't want to characterize it as dismissive, but it was a little bit dismissive, you know, about chaining ourselves to a, a tanker, but then we would get thrown in, in jail. That's what people did over civil rights. That's what you've got to do. You've got to go to the wall. I mean, the problem is that this is, the, this is not a, a subject that most people want to go and get arrested for. But people have. No, but... Yes. And, and people will have to in much more, greater numbers because it's, it's, and I recommend reading Kierkegaard, you know, on most ethical situations, it's either or. It's yeah. not and both. You can't do, you can't drive your all-terrain vehicle and preserve that, that car. It's, it's going to be one or the other, you know, it's not going to be a, a, a shit up, it's not going to be, you know, a marriage, it's not going to be that. I'm afraid one person is going to, you know, one side is going to have to give in for the greater good. And people were convinced not only by argument, but by demonstration of, of willingness to um, to sacrifice to, about about issues like this, and that we will have to again. I think that that courage has, has not been shown. On this but issue. I, I don't think that the analogy to to um, expanding civil rights it may not hold. It may not hold up. Uh, if you're talking about expanding the scope of justice and expanding moral vision. Uh, there seems to be something of a wall. I mean, expanding it to other humans uh, is is seems to be a great deal easier than expanding it to trees and dirt. You don't agree? It wasn't. I mean, for those of us who were there, it was not. Though, first of all, those were not other people. And secondly, it's a it's, it's I mean, you want to get a good Latin word, habitus is one. You know, meaning where we live as well as our habits. And we have bad habits as human beings. One of them was to, you know, do terrible things other human beings who, who were weaker than we were. So that, that era is passing now. But, but to do things to the environment, we also have the capability. And, and, and if we have to get out of these bad habits, but 
I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right that you know what is what's similar about the two situations is the is the quantity of political courage that's going to be required, right? Um, because I think we are in a we are in a similar political situation where where, where you know we're not it's not like the healthcare field. There aren't two sides. Um, there, there's not a you know there's not 49 percent of this country which is which is committed to stopping global warming. I wish I wish there were, and like 49 percent of people will say that they are committed to it. Um, but you know, but there, it's you know, uh, none of you know, it's it's not on the table, right? Healthcare is on the table, and global warming is not is not on the table, and it's not something that Obama has you know even begun to approach. Um, I mean, I think what Dan is saying, or what I would say if I were Dan, um, <laughs> is that is that I think that is that I fear that this may be an even more difficult problem to solve than than civil rights. Um, because, you know, whereas in, you know, in the 20th century, um, you know, the civil rights movement was not uh, explicitly, it was not an explicit, it was not explicitly in opposition to our economy. Um, what we need, what we need to do to stop. And that was why it got so approved. It was well, I think we're in. I think we're in an even more. I think we're in. I think we're in, in an even fiercer. It's global. Yeah. It's not. It's not. And not only that, but I, I think that uh, you know we were we were able to we were able to overcome that economically, right? Our our economy thrived during that throughout the 20th century, right? During the post during the post World War II period, our economy you know grew like crazy, um, and it's it's not clear how we're going to be able to do that and begin to solve these problems. Um, I, I mean, I have a speak for the youth, <laughs> 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 um, I guess. But being someone who um, is aware, I would say aware, of global issues, but not as far as one of those um, youth that are like, yes, let's, let's plant trees and things like that, have friends. She's very you know, much sustainable garden. Um, sustainable garden, um, global warming, things um, of that nature. I feel like as far as we're leading into things that happened in the past, like what um, you mentioned about civil rights movement, women's rights movement, which I'm um, taking history classes, women's um, history, um, I'm kind of aware of, but I feel like it is just a bigger issue in itself. It's easy to make similarities as far as the, um, the dire need for it, but being someone that is aware of the issue and is not a common practicer of things that are in need to change it, knowing that I am the future, and being someone that sees it as easier to give to someone who is more determined and let them kind of, you know, what you were discussing, that one person, you know, I can see one person doing that, but as far as her making me do those things, I feel like it's a little bit... It's, it's, it's a tug and push thing for her to make me, you know, come with her and do some of these things. But um, I feel like it's something that is complicated, and I agree with the panel, it's complicated because it doesn't deal with just a kind of person. It doesn't deal with just a kind of place. It deals with everyone. So it's easy to say, you know, civil rights have to do with civil rights, and women's issues have to do with women's issues. This is our whole big issue, and to get a whole world to agree on something it's not as easy as, you know, I feel tying ourselves to tankers and, you know, uprooting people and um, being so extreme because I feel like being so extreme is um, kind of inadvertently making people more, less, I don't know the word, less um, approachable on the subject because I feel it's very touch and go what Dr. Mark yes, was talking about, about, you know, you can't tell people you know, what to do as far as, like, if this is where they live. I know I live in, I grew up in Manhattan, and I personally feel like I love my buildings, you know. I like my trees, but, you know, I like my buildings. I do live near water, and I do live in Queens, right, across the street from a farm museum. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, at the same at the same time, I think it's also about where you live, because, honestly, I don't like where I live, but I want to go back to the city, and I love my buildings. And I think it's also a culture thing, you know, people who appreciate I think that's the problem is people don't learn to appreciate um, the 
what they have. Like, I, I do my internship on the Grand Concourse, and one of those trees, like, I don't know, 75, is right in front of my <laughs> it's right there. It's right in front of my building. And when I looked at it, I was like, this, there's a tree? I was like, there's a tree in front of my building? I was like, I, I didn't know. And I think, like, that's just a big problem is, like, people have so many ideas about it. And it's us, as far as you, we have, like, basically the weight of the world on our shoulders as far as everything is going on right now for us. And I think trying, you guys, and us trying to find a way to push that into the forefront along with all of our other problems is much better than just prioritizing our problems because I feel like maybe every problem is just, just as equally important. So there's much to be all on that. So exciting. The, the um, <laughs> economics and putting it all into a bucket. I mean, and, I mean, try, you can't. Everybody can't be the the person. Is 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 how I feel, and that's why it's interesting always to see how we can, you know, how some people can get a lot of habits to change, and you know, they have people have to be forced. But I mean, even with a, a ricky dink silly thing like bikes, you know, nobody did bike lanes three years ago in New York City, and now. People actually don't run you down all the time. The bike thing, which is a huge, huge thing. I have a friend who um, is a photographer, and he was also an editor. And he has recently uh, went back and photographed. He grew up in Mississippi. He got all he got the Mississippi um, state uh, prison authorities photos of all the freedom riders, and uh, he went back and photographed all the freedom riders. And I've gotten to meet a lot of the freedom riders from the civil rights era. And what's really phenomenal about what they did was how. You know, I heard this one guy, and it was so moving, and he, he just heard about it, and he was living in, in Queens, and he said, that, that's, that's wrong, and he wasn't in anything. He wasn't in any group or anything. He just went down, and young people started going down, you know, and he, and he did it. It's like, it's like what Facebook says they're going to do for us, you know, <laughs> but it's, they're not going to. But anyway, he changed his status, and suddenly he was in this thing. And, and the other thing about the Freedom Rides is they got on buses. They, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, you can tell I have a bus thing going, so I'm not, I'm not linking that bus with that bus, although now I'm kind of actually thinking that's exciting. But, but buses, this most mundane thing, they just got on the buses and rode and they crossed the state border and as a result they were arrested. And, and, and after that it was just so embarrassing. And so, um, but, but just to say that it's all about economics because because children who don't who just think you should cut down the trees they don't even have a chance to see the other kind of nature because nature is kind of the nature you can afford to go to I mean I would love I can't afford to have a country house you know my all my kids friends have country houses you know I still want to have my daughter have a garden but I can't have one so there's the nature you can afford to have and the other one you know so that's in, in one sense of how Things are kind of split up like that. But also, just if you look at global warming, who's it going to affect? Guess what? People without money, resources. So this, this is all about that thing of resources. And then to come down to a very crass thing, you know, one of the things I think that you can do is, I mean, I write for Vogue magazine. And you think, oh, great. Yeah, I'm sure you really care about the environment. You're writing for Vogue magazine. But, um, but uh, you know, the editor of Vogue let me write one of the longest pieces I ever wrote, uh, four or 5,000 words on endocrine disrupt disruptors. Does everybody know about that? Are you, are you wearing them now? Yeah. So um, if they're, they're in your shampoos, they're, in, they're chemicals in cosmetics. And, um, and one of the things really hard to think about the future and having kids, it's not just do I have kids because will we'll, you know, will the world be bad or good for them, but there's that second problem that compounds it, which is do I have kids because the world will be worse for them, and by having kids will I make it the world worse for them because I, we had kids, you know. So with endocrine disruptors, we're talking about, you know, how young people now, we're seeing the long-term effects of all these chemicals in the environment, and we're talking about people's reproductive systems being screwed up. Um, and, and, you know, they let me write that in a consumer, essentially a consumer magazine. So, I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to change, it's clear, you change the world, I'm not going to change the world. But, um, but somebody picked it up and made, and made a, um, you know, put, put a bill in off of that in, in Congress. It was very exciting. And, and so then all of a sudden, you know, the chemical company, and it's in Vogue, and they're for shampoo, you know? I'm for shampoo too, believe it or not. <laughs> so, so there are these points of attack, you know? 
And I, I wish I could say, oh, we can, you know, we, I have the chain or whatever. You know, some people are chainers. And, and, and this, here, I'm, I'm going to drop off after this. The saddest thing about Thoreau is that they split them up. Emerson, who loved Thoreau in many, many ways, gave a eulogy and characterized him as a, I think the quote, it's quote unquote, nature boy in, in the eulogy. And um, only in England did they realize that he was writing about economics and social injustice. It took a long time to get that back, but it's interesting that our nature writer, a guy who think of as a great nature writer, that many people admire as a great nature writer, was really saying, no, 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 it's all the same stuff, it's all the same stuff, guys, 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 guys. So, so, um, but, but it sounds like you have it all the same, so I'm saying, so thank you. Can I ask just a question for Katie? I think you probably already answered this question in your remarks, but uh, just your, as you thought about your own, I mean, did you think of yourself as a, an artist, you know, working, a nature artist, environmental artist, until you uh, came to Manhattan or until those experiences? And did you can also looking forward to you imagine yourself uh, working in that same vein or well, I think Dan that? mentioned it a little bit in when he introduced me and he said that I was called a weed lady. So when I did the work with the weeds, that's I you know, kind of heard people introducing me as the weed lady. Then I started doing the work with the trees and I was the tree lady. And um, I think it's in like any job or business or area, people get pigeonholed and put into the little box, so I was always in the eco-green box. Um, well, I'm also put into like a conceptual art box as well, so there's different boxes. But, but looking forward, do you, I mean, how do you respond or how do you well, find big, yourself responding to those pigeonholes? <coughs> yeah, it's, it's a, a terrible um, place to be, to be stuck in a box, because everything overlaps, we're all, like everything's connected, we're all connected, and it's like, We've all repeated the same thing that nature isn't out there, everything is all you know kind of overlapping and touching everything else and it's like the branches and the roots, it goes off on a tangent um, and it kind of grows like that. So I have big problems being classified as an environmental artist or a land artist or an eco artist. And one reason I was interested in coming to the States is because in my you know, my study of art history was um, well, they don't really do that over here. There were, you know, there are land artists, and uh, kind of back in the 70s, but it was mostly men who got bulldozers and made huge impacts on the land, like real physical hardcore impacts. Um, like Michael Heiser, who's building the huge city out in the west. Um, and I was coming from a much more invisible place. What I do is more invisible. So I thought, well, they don't really see things the way I do over there, so that's kind of interesting to throw myself in there, so I won't be seen as a land artist because I'm not doing anything like that at all. Most of the time I don't really physically put things out there, but the tree museum we just had small markers that marked each of the 100 trees, so physically there wasn't really, it was mostly invisible. Um, so to try and get back to the, whole, the question, it was, it's, um, it's really problematic because when you get it put into a pigeonhole, a lot of people kind of tuned out. So I'm interested in having conversations and people are like, well, I'm not going to go and see that show, I'm not going to look at your work because you're dealing with those issues and I'm not interested in those issues. I want to just look at art, for example, or whatever. Um, so it's really problematic. Um, most of the time when I'm invited to speak, it is on um, panels. Like I said before, it's usually visual art panels, but it's all, it's either got the title land art or environmental art, like the panel tomorrow. Um, which would be really exciting because it's a bit scientist, so that doesn't happen, I don't get that opportunity ever. Um, but it's, I think really, we need to kind of open the box, because in the future, like my work, who I am, is all about looking at these things, so I'm not going to stop doing what I do. Um, but it really, it's really frustrating to be categorized. Like I'm in Manhattan, which is one of the big centers of, in like the known universe for contemporary visual art. Um, but you kind of feel like you're not really part of that system because you're doing stuff, something that's seen by a lot of people as um, out there. So it's not about art. So you're always a nature boy when you die. <laughs> 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 I thought you were, when you started the question, I thought you were going to ask me about, you know, going to the whole activism side of things. So like maybe, Dan, you, when we spoke on the phone, um, we had that conversation, I had this conversation just this week with somebody, um, 
do I see my work as, as being, am I an activist? And do I want to make changes in a concrete way like that? And I've always, my work is very political, but I think everything that everybody does is political. Like every time we, we're in a shop, we, you know, we hear this all the time, it's um, obvious. So what I do is political, but I don't like to say I am a political artist and what I'm doing is, um, like to listen to what I'm doing, I want to try and make you change your mind or we're doing really bad things to the planet, let's think about it. I like to leave it a little bit more open because I'm just asking questions. Um, so for me, it's very, it's also problematic to say, hey, I'm an artist and I want to try and change things, it's like social work. Because when I was working with these schools, that was a big issue. I was like, well, I'm, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing something called the Tree Museum. I don't really know what it is. I'm trying to learn. Can you tell me what you know? And so it was really, I was learning more from them than they were learning from me. Um, and that's what it's all about, just asking questions and trying to figure it out. I think that that probably, oh, I'm sorry, did you? I just said I was babbling again. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. Uh, I think that we probably have to have to wrap up, but um, thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, for our Please look up everybody's work. Uh, uh, I, I think two of you up here have a, have a website. Robert, I know, has a website about Thoreau, but it's sparsely updated. Uh, Katie, oh, it's over. Uh, but Katie's, if you want to see Katie's work, katieholton.com. Yeah. .com. Very easy to remember. Some great images on there. And treemuseum.org. And treemuseum.org. Because the, they're no longer up, right? The, 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 no, the, I deinstalled it, find the last part of it last Friday, so I was still kind of feeling bruised. Yeah. And please look up Susan's book, which, uh, and, and N plus one. Take a look.